The pandemic has made a lot of things really difficult, not the least of them dating. Today, we're asking how much does it cost to be single and how do you set up your finances for success? Welcome to Stress Test, a Globe and Mail podcast where we look at how the rules of personal finance have changed in the pandemic for Gen Z and millennials. I'm Rob Carrick, personal finance columnist at the Globe and Mail. And I'm Roma Luzio, personal finance editor at the Globe. So Rob, today we're talking about being single. Uh, do you remember being single? And uh, if so, what were some of the big things that stick out from a money perspective? Well, it has been a while since I was single. I've been married for close to 30 years. Uh, but I was single for a number of years in the workforce. I sort of had those... Uh, that. It's a great period when you just get your first job and you've got a steady, decent income and you got your own place and you're thinking, what can I do, you know, and uh, matching that against being careful and thinking ahead. I was not really one to think ahead when I was young. I mean, I, I was smart and I didn't get into any debt problems, but I was not a big saver. I I like to do fun stuff and that meant spending pretty much all I had. And uh, I went along that way for quite a while. What about you? Uh, I guess the thing that really sticks out in my mind from being single was how things were more expensive from a travel and living perspective, right? So if you're taking a trip, you have to pay for the hotel room by yourself. You have to pay for uh, the dinner out by yourself. You're not splitting anything, right? So the bills are the bills. And then, you know, for living expenses, you're paying for the internet, for apps, for subscriptions. I didn't know that at the time because it just seemed like something you paid for. I'll come back at you with a plus of being single personal finance wise. And that is zero compromising. You want to <laughs> buy something? You do. I mean, I bought a number of sports cars over and over. Like I traded them in every one, two, three years for a little while there. Cause I was just thinking, do I want that? Ah, yeah, I do. I'm going to do that. And uh, when you're in a couple, you have the combined earning power and the combined financial support, which is huge. And I think that is nets out as a giant plus, but there is something kind of fun and free about just uh, deciding your, you know, your finance committee has one member and it decides to make an expense or spend money. You do it. Are you saying your wife doesn't let you buy a nice fancy car? No, actually, no. I, I have brought her around to enjoying the virtues of a of a decent automobile, but um, you know, it was just it was just different. You know, what it was just a little bit more a uh, little bit more spontaneous. For sure. I mean, I saw a stat somewhere that singles pay for seventy five to eighty percent of the costs that a couple split, and so there's no doubt that uh, the big ticket things, housing, transportation, utilities. Those things are more expensive uh, if you are a party of one as opposed to multiple people. And so what does that mean for you if you're planning your finances as a single person? Well, I mean, it makes it much harder to get into the housing market because rather than having two people saving and gathering up their savings to put towards a down payment, you're on your own. Affording the mortgage becomes a little trickier. Um, I, I think a huge impact of being single is the importance of having a good emergency fund because you don't have a partner or a spouse to sort of provide support. I'm I'm out of the workforce temporarily, but my partner is still working. They're bringing in income. They are covering the mortgage. There's just so much more of a weight on the single individual to, uh, to, to continue to pay for expenses mm -hmm. when they are unable to work. And so you really do need to protect yourself. Uh, and in retirement, I mean, two people saving for retirement sort of doubles your retirement savings power. One person has really got to work double time to build up the retirement savings assets. Okay. So with all of these things to consider, the question is, how do you set yourself up for financial success as a single person? We actually spoke to someone who's done a pretty good job of that, and she even managed to buy a house at the start of the pandemic. We're going to London, Ontario to hear her story next. Stress Test is brought to you by CPP Investments, manager of the Canada Pension Plan Fund. The fund is sustainable with over $500 billion in assets, thanks to CPP Investments. Learn more at cppinvestments.com. For this episode, we did a call out asking you what it's been like to set up your finances as a single person. Maya is one of the people who wrote back to us. She's 34 years old, works in HR, and lives in London, Ontario. And she's not originally from Canada. That's where her story starts. Yeah, I'm originally from Holland in Europe, and I came over when I was in my early 20s. 
Maya moved to Canada for love. I came to Canada originally for my ex-boyfriend. Um, he is Canadian and um, I was young and naive. And so I decided to move out to Canada and be with him forever. So that obviously did not work out. Um, but I'm still here in Canada. It's still really like the country itself. It isn't easy to set yourself up in a new country. So when Maya arrived in Calgary for a new life with her boyfriend at the time, she settled into living with him and his financial situation. So coming to Calgary, financially, it wasn't very complicated because my everything was in my ex's name. Um, he had a place that we could stay at. Um, all the bills were in his name. Um, he got me a copy of his credit card, but my name was never added. Um, I was added to his car insurance as like an occasional driver. Even though this helped her settle quickly into a new country, it meant she had little to no financial assets in her own name and no financial history. If they were to break up, she would have to start building up her finances from scratch, which is exactly what happened. In hindsight, it was not smart to have everything in his name because when we broke up, but six years later, um, I had nothing in my name. I had no history, uh, no credit history, nothing. Um, so I had to basically start from scratch, even though I'd already been here for over a half a decade. Luckily, Maya did have some savings. When she moved to Calgary, she had enrolled in night school to earn her degree in HR while using her morning working co-ops to earn some money. The next thing Maya needed was a credit card. She had no credit history, so the best the bank could do for her was give her a secured credit card with a $1,000 limit. That means you have to provide a cash deposit on that card. But after all of that, she still couldn't catch a break. You see, Maya was working for a company in the oil and gas industry, and this was Calgary in 2015. Anyone who is familiar with Calgary knows that 2015 was not a good year for oil and gas in Calgary. Um, so when I graduated, my manager told me, we can give you a contract until December. And then after that, we can't keep you on anymore. So just a heads up between now, which was May and December, you're going to have to find a different position. Maya had to scramble to find a job. So she did the obvious thing. She Googled around to see what she could find. So I went online on LinkedIn and I Googled HR and Dutch because that's the only thing that sets me apart from all the other thousands of new grads in the HR field. And one job popped up, which was here in London, Ontario. Um, they have an office in Amsterdam, and that's why they needed someone who speaks Dutch. And it was kind of meant to be. This was such a smart move. She doubled down on the one skill set that set her apart, her ability to speak Dutch. Maya took the job and moved out to London in October. But the new job came with a pay cut, a $30,000 pay cut. The transition from Calgary to London is extreme. Um, rent was a couple hundred bucks cheaper a month. So that was great for a bigger unit. Um, but my salary went down from uh, 72 to 46 so I lost close to 30 grand a year in income. Now, cost of living in London is quite a bit lower as well. So it, it evened out a bit, but it definitely changed my lifestyle. Even though she took a massive pay cut, Maya was in okay financial shape. She didn't have any debt. She had those savings we mentioned earlier, and she was finally able to get a regular credit card. She also found out that the new company she worked for had a great RSP plan, which she decided to take advantage of, on top of putting away savings to make sure she had a solid safety net. My company is very generous with their group RSP plan. I put in 5%, they match 7%, so it's 12% in total. Uh, it's hard to find nowadays anything like that. So that's what I put away for pension. Um, and then I have a TFSA for any medium term plans. And then I have what I call a safety net. And so I've calculated how much I need on a bare minimum basis per month. 
um, took AI off of that and then came up with what do I need to keep myself safe for about eight months. Um, so that is in the TFSA as well, but it's not something that I get to take out. Um, and then I have a float, which is uh, a couple thousand dollars that is in my day-to-day -day savings account, um, just in case something happens. If my car dies again, um, like my previous car, she needed a new alternator and that's over a grand and you suddenly have to cough that up and I didn't want to put it on a credit card. Um, so that's what the float is for, for anything that is unexpected that I can't just take out of my regular pay. So overall, I think, I think it's going okay. I, I'd say I'm a, I'm a self-sufficient single at this point. Maya was actually able to use the money from the RSP to buy a house in March 2020, right as the lockdown began. The down payment was $35,000 from my group RSP. Um, and once I told my mom that I was buying a house, she got very excited for me and she, they contributed 5,000 euros. So about 7,500, um, to my down payment. Uh, the total cost of the house was 271,000 and a hundred dollars. Um, I was not the highest bid, <laughs> but it, uh, that was the final price. It was put on the market for two thirty. This is all really impressive, and I'd say Maya is in great shape financially. At 34 years old, she bought her own home and is financially self-sufficient. And besides a small gift from her mom, she did this all on her own. How did that feel? Absolutely terrifying. Um, there's not as much information out there as I was hoping for. A lot of the information is for couples. Um, and they're all talking about spousal RSPs and uh, planning to do income splitting. And, oh, if you go to Costco, make sure you buy in bulk. And I tried that. And a lot of food rotted away and went to waste. Um, not everything that is out there is actually applicable to uh, single people and especially single women. We make less money. We take breaks for dependent care. We um, don't progress as far in the workforce as men do, um, just on average. And we tend to live longer. So we have a longer retirement to fund, even though we have less income to, to spend on saving for that retirement. So um, a lot of this was, I did what felt right. And so that's what I put together. Um, a big part of it is luck. If I worked at a company that didn't offer a group RSP, I don't think I would be in the position that I'm at right now because uh, I used the RSP for my down payment um, for that first time home buyer plan. So yeah, it's luck and just doing what seemed to work for me. Um, and then hoping that eventually more information would come out that would match my particular situation. So that's the story of Maya's financial situation from arriving in Canada until now. And she's very committed to handling her finances solo, even now as she's in a new relationship. So I am dating someone right now, but I'm still operating as a single household. Um, it's still just me and the dog in my house. He has his own house, his own dog, his own car. Um, and so all of that is completely separate. To be honest, I don't see that mixing anytime soon. Maya, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Maya is a great example of someone who's young and recovered well from a situation that could have been problematic. And I mean, lots of people do this. They let their partner take control when it comes to handling their finances, when really it should be a shared position. But the important lesson here is that she's recovered and she's doing all of the good things, right? She's a homeowner. She's building retirement savings. She's got a good credit score. She has an emergency fund. There's no question that she's really turned it around. Rob, what's your two cents on Maya? To me, uh, Maya dramatizes what is possible. You know, we've talked a bit about, and we will get into further detail on the challenges that singles face, but Maya demonstrates what you can do if you get your act together. You can own a house. I'm pretty impressed by that. Yeah, absolutely. Especially given how hard it is to do that now. Here's someone that's done all those things. And I mean, her story is really inspiring. 
It is. But, you know, I think what we want to do here is provide some sort of a roadmap to help other people bring their finances along like Maya does. And I think our next guest, Bridget Casey, is going to have some interesting things to say on that. CPP Investments is proud to manage the assets of the Canada Pension Plan Fund. The Canada Pension Plan provides retirees a solid income foundation. In support of that important priority, We've built a well-balanced and globally diversified portfolio. It's designed to be resilient in the face of wide-ranging market and economic conditions. Through good times and bad, our professional investment teams have helped make CPP a plan that contributors and beneficiaries can count on for generations to come. Learn more at cppinvestments.com. Today I'm talking to someone you might remember from season one. Bridget Casey is the founder of the personal finance site Money After Graduation, and she's based in Calgary. You know, Bridget, when we spoke to Maya, she said she wanted to know she was on the right track if her situation was normal. So I just want to start by looking at her story. Is it typical? What lessons could you draw out of it? Uh, She actually sounds like she's further ahead than many millennials and young people, but I also understand wanting to keep your finances separate. And that's very important. I think we're still used to, in partnerships, one person might be better with money than the other. So you let them have more control over the money. And it poses two problems. First, that you end up with things often all in one person's name. And not just savings accounts, but sometimes it can impact your credit score. You can leave a relationship and have no credit history because all the credit was also in their name. And there's also just uh, you're behind in financial literacy because you haven't been managing the finances for that time. So her situation of relying on a partner where he managed most of the finances is not unusual. Um, I see that often. And I also see people wanting to take more (laughs) control over their finances when they leave those relationships. Um, Can you give us a picture um, from your point of view? What does the financial picture look like generally for millennial singles? How are they doing with uh, saving and investing? I mean, they're doing okay. They're starting to gain some traction now, or at least they were before the pandemic. But compared to couples, they're far behind. They just can't catch up because fundamentally, it just is easier to share costs with a partner, especially when those costs are large expenses like housing or car ownership. Like splitting a vehicle with someone also relieves you of hundreds of dollars in expenses. It's even easier, like groceries are cheaper when you're with someone. Basically, everything is more affordable and it's easier to save and invest when you have a partner. So singles are behind the couples for sure. What mistakes do you see uh, millennial singles making when it comes to uh, financial decisions? Well, the first is also just like planning that they might have a partner later. Many people will neglect their debts or neglect saving and investing um, because they're still hoping maybe that they'll meet someone and get, and often they do. Most people do eventually find a partner at some point, but you also have to plan in case that you'll be single for the rest of your life. And in particularly for women, I think they don't realize how much they really need to save and invest for the future because women tend to outlive men by a significant amount. I think like eight to 10 years, they need more expensive care in later in life. But in the meantime, they're also typically earning less than men. So you have to actually save more for a longer retirement while you're earning less. So it's a it's a big challenge, especially for young uh, millennial and Gen Z women. How has the pandemic changed the way single millennials should be thinking about their finances? <laughs> I think it emphasized for all of us how important an emergency fund is and how important it is to invest. And I think we also never pictured a scenario where people would experience income interruption, like childcare interruption. I know that was a big one for me. And also the stock market crash when it happened, everything happened all at once. And I think it brought to light vulnerabilities that you might have in your financial picture and in your budget. So I hope it inspired people really just to uh, save and invest more because you you never know what can happen. (laughs) Let's talk a bit about the emergency fund. How much bigger should, because we talked about how uh, singles have like a, bear a bigger financial load than couples. How much bigger should a singles um, emergency fund be than, than someone who's in a couple? 
Uh, well, you're still aiming for three to six months. Well, now since the pandemic, I now tell people six to 12 months of essential expenses. So it's the same number. It's just for a couple of uh, 12 months of expenses is lower per person than it is for a single person. But ideally, you should be aiming for that. And I know people listening to this are probably horrified at the prospect of saving up 12 months of uh, essential expenses could it because it is a significant financial burden, but an emergency fund of that size is not something that you accumulate in a few months or a year. This really has to be a dedicated effort uh, that you should be contributing to as long as it takes to build one. So I even tell people to start with as little as $25 or $50 a week in a high interest savings account. Doing it weekly makes it a little bit easier to swallow the cost. And still at the end of the year, I mean, you you can end up with over $1,000 or $2,000, even with small amounts like that. As a general rule of thumb, how much should singles be saving on an ongoing basis compared to couples? Uh, the general rule of thumb that I tell people is it should be 10% of your net income should be going into retirement accounts, either the TFSA or the RSP or both. When you're younger, you can get away with a slightly lower percentage um, just because you have more time to save. But you should aim to save between 6 and 10%. And more is always better. So you definitely want to shoot for like 12 or 15% if you can afford it in your budget. A lot of single millennials are want houses just as much as millennials in couples, but they have half the earning power and half the down payment savings power. So how do you juggle, I want a house with, I know I need to save for retirement if I'm a single? Uh, I mean, you've followed me for a long time. You know how I feel about uh, the housing market. I think a lot of young Canadians, they might just have to actually let go of their dream of home ownership. And that's probably easier than trying to save the amount to get into a home. I mean, the unaffordability in most Canadian cities is just crazy. If home ownership is really a goal for you, then you have to seriously consider moving. Otherwise, your best defense is just saving and investing in the stock market. For many people, though, home ownership is part of their retirement plan. And in that case, I understand why you value it and why you might stretch your budget in order to get into a house. But I mean, you know me personally, I really don't like it. I would rather people focus on accumulating uh, cash assets rather than stunt their retirement savings for years because they've stretched themselves to get into a house they couldn't really afford. Bridget, no one has tried harder to open people's minds to not owning homes in Canada than <laughs> I have, and it is not going well. <laughs> I don't know how your campaign is going, but mine is mine is slow work. It's not going well. <laughs> um, you uh, touched on this uh, topic uh, a few minutes ago, but I want to return to it because I think it's super important. And it, it, it's about millennial women and the special um, care they need to take with their finances that are maybe a little bit different than men. Can you, what, can you help uh, you know, single millennial women understand what they're up against and what that means for their, for their saving and investing? Uh, yeah, I think uh, single millennial women first just have to accept that they need more savings and investments, and it's going to be harder to accumulate them. It's also true that women tend to carry more student loan debt than men. And then what happens for many women is that their child rearing years coincide with like their just when they're getting started in their career. So many women end up at between like 28 to 35, where they still have student loan payments, and they're taking time away from the workforce to raise children. And you really just have to be aware First of all, the tax benefits that are out there, like understand how the TFSA and the RSP work for reducing your taxable income and tax sheltering your investments for the long term, because that will help you get the most bang for the buck for the money that you put away. Understand like how important it is to negotiate your salary, like try to make up for that gender pay gap uh, as much as you can and try to just over save and invest any extra money that you have, throw it into your investment accounts. As the pandemic presses on, what should singles do to protect themselves from the changes that keep happening? Job layoffs, the housing market gets more expensive. Um, you know, I know that we're looking ahead to a stronger economy when, uh, when finally we're enough of us are vaccinated that we can open up the economy. But I, I'm not sure it's going to be a smooth ride. Some people who have been furloughed 
uh, may not be called back to work. Companies may be taking advantage of current uh, turmoil to restructure. Um, it, it, we, we've got a lot of uncertainty ahead. How can the single millennial uh, best prepare for it? One of the most important things and what I'm like pushing young people to do so much of is please like get started investing. One of the nice things about all of this and the technology developments that we've had recently is it's easier than ever to access the stock market. You can literally open an account with $100 on your phone and start investing. So take advantage of these robo advisors and these accounts and really just start with like $50 if that's all you have. Bridget, what um, what are some positives, uh, financially speaking, of being single? Are there any? Yeah. Oh man, there's a lot. (laughs) And I say that as a, as a single person. So one of the nicest things is that you're totally in control of all your money. You are saving and investing exactly how you want to do. When you're part of a couple, there's a lot of negotiations that have to happen in the investments that you choose, how you spend your money, what's an appropriate budget, how you manage your debt. Like I've seen many of my friends' relationships. These are big challenges of like, should we pay off our student loans or invest? Should we buy weed stocks or ETFs? So being single and being entirely in control of your finances is really empowering and really satisfying because no one's going to mess it up. What's your number one piece of advice to to the single millennial? Like you, if you could give them one sentence worth of do this and this will be the difference maker, what would it be? Max out your TFSA in the stock market. That's the that's the single thing that will ensure the most financial security. And I know you've done this math and I've shown this math as well, that if you just max out your TFSA starting in your 20s or 30s, it's going to be over a million dollar asset. It will generate a tax-free uh, income in retirement. You're done. So if, if you can only do one thing, it's max out your TFSA in the stock market. Great. That's a great way to leave it off. Thanks, Bridget. You're welcome. That was Bridget Casey. She's the founder of the personal finance site Money After Graduation based in Calgary. You can check out her website at www.moneyaftergraduation.com. Here are my takeaways from this episode. One, start investing. Even if it's a small amount, you will thank yourself later. As much as you can, add money to TFSAs and RRSPs. Two, make full use of any retirement plans your company might have, like a pension or a group RRSP. Three, emergency funds are mandatory for singles. Start adding money to yours as soon as you can. Four, and finally, even if you do end up in a couple, keep some control over your own money. Thank you for listening to Stress Test. This show was produced by Latifa Abdin and Hannah Sung. Audio post-production by Kyle Fulton and Carly Reem Neal. Our executive producer is Kieran Rana. Thank you to Maya in London, Ontario for sharing your story with us. If you like what you heard, let the world know. Leave us a rating and review at Apple Podcasts. And if you know someone who wants to figure out how to stay on top of their finances, send them this show. Our next episode is going to be all about negotiating your salary. It's easy to save money when you have money. So how do you get more of it? You can find Stress Test at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And you can find us at theglobeandmail.com where we cover all things financial. Singles, couples, we love you all. Thanks for listening. Stress Test is brought to you by CPP Investments, manager of the Canada Pension Plan Fund. Canadians can be confident in the fund's sustainability. In the last 10 years, CPP Investments has earned more than $300 billion for the Canada Pension Plan. With over $500 billion invested around the world, CPP is set to provide a retirement income foundation for generations to come. Learn more at cppinvestments.com.